Welcome to this morning's uh, selective soldering debate. Uh, the SMT process has accelerated the use of selective soldering systems alongside or sometimes replacing uh, wave soldering systems. Uh, miniaturiz miniaturization is one of the main challenges, of course, and um, here to discuss some of these challenges is a very distinguished panel of guests. To my extreme right, we have Ernie Grice from Kurt uh, We have Eddie Groves from uh, uh, Pillar House. Uh, we have to his right uh, Andreas Reinhardt from Seho Systems and of course to my extreme right Alan Cable from ACE uh, or is it Norton ACE? <laughs> it's Norton ACE. It's Norton ACE now, just recently acquired so uh, congratulations on that. Thank you. So um, thank you for joining me gentlemen. Uh, I'm going to kick off straight away with our very first uh, question which is um, what is the most effective way of soldering miniature connections or connectors and through whole components in hard to reach areas. Uh, Ernie, do you want to start with that one? Well, I mean, first and foremost, um, you know, you have to have uh, the fundamentals, right? So you have to have a good flux on there that's going to be able to withstand uh, the preheat temperatures and such. Uh, you need repeatability X, Y, and Z, right? So, so Kurt Serso's philosophy is servo gantry moving X, Y, and Z. Uh, very, very repeatable nozzle sizes, so you could have nozzle sizes ranging from uh, 32 millimeters down to, you know, one millimeter. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's all dependent on pitch, it's dependent on um, uh, lead length, it's dependent on pad size, it's dependent on uh, thermal ground plane. It, it's a, you know, it's a, uh, you know, you have to consider all of these things when you're looking into being able to do that. Right, right. Eddie, you, you mentioned uh, uh, fluxes uh, uh, earlier on. I mean, how yeah. important is that side of it? Yes, uh, that it's a, definitely an important consideration. You may be driven to use water soluble, or maybe even an old rosin type of flux, depending on the vintage of product. If it's military, you might be in some of those kinds of products. But most of us deal with no clean. And like he mentioned, you need a flux and skin, especially no clean, that has enough in it to withstand the temperatures you might. Uh, be exposing your product to. Mm -hmm. If you've got thermal ground planes, like you mentioned, you know, may maybe heavy parts, um, or you just, or a thick board, a lot of layers, you're going to need a flux that can withstand all that heat that board needs to solder. Right. But in specific regards to the small connectors, I think the biggest thing, uh, or contributing factor, that is lead length and spacing of your metal to metal. So the land size of uh, fine pitch connectors. Really important to understand how far away those little lands are from each other and the lead length, the protrusion. Right. Right. But you're getting smaller all the time, of course. Yes, uh, yes, yeah. we are. Andres, how do, how do you deal with, uh, what's the SEHO approach to this? Yes, of course, um, there's a lot you can do in the design of the PCB mm -hmm. to handle this. And, uh, if you have uh, surface mount components just next to the through holes, it's getting more and more complicated. And um, the minimum we can achieve concerning the distance is dip soldering, but uh, this of course requires a special tool for one product. And um, so you need to take into account uh, what you can solve with a standard nozzle or you need a dip soldering tool. Alan, do, I mean, do Many designers really design much for manufacturability using selective soldering systems, or is that oh, an afterthought? Only the smart ones. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I mean that uh, facetiously because uh, truly, it's uh, they're not designed for maximum productivity. They're designed for compactness, mm -hmm. and, uh, and the smaller the better. Right. Yeah. So I think everything these gentlemen say is correct as far as soldering. I, but I think there's uh, there's no good one formula. It's a lot of know-how. Yeah. Every, all the machines will do what you ask them to do, mm -hmm. but knowing what to do, is, it's almost intuitive after a while. And, and having multiple nozzles, nozzles so you can get the absolute right size nozzle for, for, the, app, for the applications, that's... Uh, well, that's true. I think, I think we all have versions of how to do that, uh, but it's important if you have a small 
site that you're soldering on a larger board, you want to be able to use just that small nozzle where you have to to get in there for the keep away. And a larger nozzle elsewhere, if you can do that, you've got much more robust process yeah. with a larger nozzle. It also yeah, exactly. affects cycle time too, which is always a concern in selective like soldering. True. Right. It's not like a wave. Yeah. But, the, but the point is, is you know, to your original uh, question is, you know, having a, a, a mini wave, flexible XYZ, is, is, is really the most stable process for soldering five pitch connectors. If you're dipping it or uh, stamp soldering it in another, you know, you're, you're risking bridges and uh, so, so mini nozzle XYZ is, is the way to go. Yeah. Okay. How big the problem is, is board warpage inside the soldering? Um, we'll just start with that. Um, I'll start with you this time. Okay. Well, warping is, is definitely a, an issue you have to address. Some boards do it, some boards don't. Thicker boards, say heavy military boards, backplanes, you know, usually you don't have to worry about those. It's like the small ones where you've got 30 in a panel, a lot of cutouts, breakaways, things like that. They're kind of moving, and as you solder, things move even more or differently. So you got to have a way to accommodate that. When you program a selected machine, you're specifying a, you know, a pump height, a nozzle height, and if that is changing, you gotta have some way of accommodating that. Either by the software or the technology, like a board warp correction type of technology, or you might have to put it flat in the panel or a fixture, a pallet of some sort. But it's definitely a concern, especially when you get to these small nozzles. You know, they don't ha have a lot of play in their flow, as opposed to a mini wave type thing, and you've got a little more leeway. But it's important the tighter we get, the smaller the components. So, so, yeah. so, 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 um yeah, I agree with everything Eddie said. It's perfect. I mean, you either you either find a way to compensate for what what warp occurs. Sometimes the weight of the board itself, with the components on it, will yeah. give it a belly, and that's set. That's your starting point. Yeah. Or it changes as you heat it up. And sometimes you can, they warp up. Sometimes they warp down. Yeah. And you know, the a, a simple way, if you have a lot of production, is to put it in a fixture mm -hmm. and hold it flat. Uh, sometimes you've got to do that again. Yeah, there are a lot of variables. Yeah. Andres, do you have anything that you would add to this on the on Well, uh, uh, a fixture is of course a good good solution, mm -hmm. and uh, if you cannot make it because it's too expensive, then a sensor inside of the machine is able to detect the warpage. And uh, if you if you can afford it, it's it's a good idea, I think, right. to have a stable process. Yeah, I mean, when, when do you find out if the board is warped? I mean, when you put it into production. Uh, which time you then got to go and start thinking about fixturing? Uh, there are some things that are elementary, right? You have a big, <coughs> you have a larger panel, and it's uh, maybe a, an 062 standard type panel that's got some heavy transformers on it. You know, mm -hmm. just holding it there, you can see the bend. Now you're putting, you're heating it up, right? You're getting it past the glass transition point, so it's really going to sag. Right. You, you know pretty much ahead of time. But the, but the point is, is that you know the goal is always level, mm -hmm. right? Always level. Um, you know, even with warping detection, you're compensating for something that is not an ideal situation in the selected solder process. Right. Okay, um, moving on. So, um, what about the use of nitrogen in selected soldering? How important is that, uh, Alan? Very important. <laughs> you cannot do it. I mean, you cannot. <laughs> We'd all agree. Yeah. I think yeah, you I cannot agree. solder without nitrogen. That's and a it's universal not just law. Nitrogen. It's ultra pure nitrogen. Mm -hmm. If uh, especially with lead-free small nozzles, yeah. If you're not pumping in the purest of nitrogen, let's say with oxygen contents of uh, around uh, 10 parts per million, right? Yep. Yeah. You've got to be in that group to keep everything clean. Otherwise, you're you know you're you're starting off with your feet tied. Right. You've got to have that. Five nines. That's Five the, nines pure. That's yeah. the number. The better that's, your nitrogen, the better your process. Yeah. There's just no question yeah. about it. It's not like a wave in the past where it would kind of clean itself or we'd push the dross off the back. Mm -hmm. That dross is creating a skin on a lot of these nozzles that we all use and it doesn't solder properly and it can leave it on your board very easily because it makes contact with that dross. I mean, don't and forget that. also that the, you know, the wetting force changes in nitrogen, yeah. right? Yeah. So, yeah. so the wetting force changes in nitrogen and you actually get better wetting, better topside hole fill as a result of using the nitrogen than you would in air. So that helps a lot as well. And your flux doesn't have to work as hard with nitrogen around. 
Right. And honestly, if we if we have problems in the field, and it's to do with uh, you know bridging or clogging or something like that, the first thing we hone in on with that customer is to check the quality of your nitrogen. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, and I would say nine times out of ten, it's because there's a problem with the quality of the nitrogen. Absolutely. And with a trained yeah. eye, you can see it immediately where so a new using, customer is they're using not. bad quality nitrogen, or they're, or they're applying it wrongly? Uh, it could be a leak in the system. Yeah. It could be that their uh, their source is uh, not clean enough. Whatever it is, could if, be it, they have if rubber it is dirty, that's it's bad. Yeah. Um, that's one of the things that we're looking at in our machinery is is actually measuring that uh, the, the the O2. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Right in the machine. So it, the machine is, is now, it knows what the purity so is of the machine. If, if, it, if it drops out of a range, yeah. the machine stops. Yeah, we do it's that really as well. Yeah. In the micro nozzles, the small nozzles, uh, we got it right at the nozzle. We measure it mm -hmm. right at the nozzle. So it's getting that important. People are understanding it and they're buying the, buying the proper systems to support selective because a lot more people are familiar with selective. Now they recognize it. When we first got into the business a long time ago, people would ask, why do we need nitrogen? Now most people know why we need nitrogen. People like to use nitrogen because it's a cost. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah, but again, people, uh, customers will at times try to get away with a less quality because yeah. it's a lot less mm. expensive. Or they'll buy a generator that yeah. can't really support the flow rate, and then yeah. that also yeah. ruins your purity. So. But you asked the question, it's critical. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad he said that. And, and just, how does, uh, what's your approach to money? Well, it's, I can only say 10 ppm is our limit that we say for the select if you want. Mm -hmm. If you want to get good soaring results, you should keep the 10 ppm limit. 10 ppm. And also measuring the quality is, is important and right. you, can, right. you can do it. Okay. Um, what is the best method of uh, clutching to prevent clogging? Well, I mean, there's, there's a number of approaches to it. That's so. a little bit of a loaded question. <laughs> uh, uh, no, no pun intended, but it, it's all dependent on, on what you're trying to flux, right? Mm -hmm. So if you have a 38% rosin flux, for which they would use in the military, I'm going to give you a different answer than if they were using a 4% solid, you know, uh, alcohol-based dicarboxylic acid, no clean, right? right? Totally different things. Drop jet, ultrasonics. Um, spray atomization. Um, mm -hmm. There's there's uh, even even uh, dip type methods. Uh, there's different types of methods. It's all really related to. Uh, what I can say is is that you know ninety, I would say probably ninety eight percent of the industry is drop jet. Um, drop jet. And then there's the other methods, right? Atomization, um, ultrasonics uh, for flux specifics. What are the most effective ones, you know, to prevent clogging? Why don't you define what clogging is? The, the, the nozzle gets uh, Oh, you talk about the nozzle? Yeah. Okay, yeah. I think the the, uh, the flux itself that you put on the board doesn't necessarily affect the nozzle clogging so much as the cleanliness or the, of the nitrogen. Uh, the, the duration between uses of the nozzle, if it's sitting there in open atmosphere, it doesn't really, it, it will clog up the, uh, the nozzle. As, you're, as the nozzle is hitting the bottom of the board, it'll absorb some of the flux that's already on there. It helps, it helps keep it clean just by use. The more you use it, the better it is. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but there's various ways of, of what we call tinning or cleansing the nozzle. We all have ways of doing that, I think. Are you talking about solder nozzle or yeah. flux nozzle? You're talking about the solder nozzle. You're talking about flux, about flux, flux nozzles, nozzles, yeah. Uh, okay. Flux is a sticky uh, if you say answer, flux, I'm I like, knew you were talking about. Yeah. 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 Well, I think the two different answers there. The two They're both right. Two different yeah. situations. Two different questions. Yeah. Good yeah. point. So you, you need to ask that question. Yeah. <laughs> How do you keep the nozzle clean? How do you keep the nozzle clean? The solder nozzle clean. Solder nozzle. Yeah. Mm. I don't know. I mean, you yeah. obviously have to keep it um, keep it uh, thin and flowing. I guess. No, we again we have ways of doing that. Mm -hmm. Everyone. Sure. Well, the flux. I just have to say too. It is one of the things that we talk about with customers because a lot of people just take the flux from their wave if it's the first time they're getting selective and take it from away and put it into their selective machine, it may not be, be the right flux for selective process. So True. we do spend time kind of ed educating customers about that. Um, and selective or flux manufacturers are coming up with new selective specific type flux because they have a completely different heat exposure than say Wave does. You know, Wave is very consistent in the time and the heat is similar, 
And the right. preheat purpose in wave is different than selective. So fluxes now are they're starting to manufacture fluxes that, that last longer. They don't dry out as fast. Right. So they don't clog as easy. And they don't spread out as far. And they don't spread out right. as far. Right. But if you get heavy ones, I mean, we get in, like he mentioned, there's some RMAs that are lower percentage, like 16 or 18. You can still do those with an ultrasonic. It still requires maintenance, though. Mm -hmm. You can't mm -hmm. just let them sit for two or three days and right. just come back and run it. you got to take care of it, maybe flush yeah. it with alcohol. But yeah. uh, for most, most of selective, it is drop jack. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Okay. I think you have to, obviously, the monitoring is an important part to me. Uh, and then you have to clean it manually. Um, all right, moving on, gentlemen, let's see, where are we? Um, what about the, how should you perform maintenance and what key elements need attention? Let's start with Andreas on that. Well, first of all, the fluxing nozzle needs, fluxing nozzle, okay. needs, a, needs attention. And um, flushing it with alcohol, cleaning it is important. It depends on how much you use it and how much it just stands there. Mm -hmm. um, preheating. If you have quartz preheaters, um, of course you need to clean the, the glass so that you have the same the same power going through the glass every time. Mm -hmm. And the um, most important thing already mentioned, the nozzles itself. Uh, so it depends on what How what long can these machines go down you know, and be idle before they start clogging up and becoming a problem? I mean, because... I think if you've... Uh, even if you shut down for half an hour, uh, you come, when you come back up, you need to uh, clean the top of the drop jet, drop jet mm -hmm. just to give it a little swab with some alcohol. Um, and I think generally you always tint, you always retin the nozzle in some fashion. Once you do those two things, heat being already established, heat of the solder, you can just start to uh, go right away. Right. right. So you have that. You need to do that even if it's as little as half an hour. Okay. Even throughout the day, Throughout yeah. the process, while you're running with a wettable nozzle, you know you can stop wetting on a side, and you have to see that, and then go in and brush that and clean that. Um, we've developed a way that actually we're monitoring the nozzle at all time and the flow. Mm -hmm. And if there is any, you know, if there is, uh, uh, it sees that the the wave shape and the flow down the nozzle is not correct, it automatically generates a cleaning cycle, and it will go and clean it and then it'll do a wayfind test and go back to work. So, I mean, the amount of time that we want to maintain is as little as possible. Yeah, of course, of course. But you still have to. Yeah. But one, of the big, one of the big problems in most factories is machine downtime. You know, I mean, you know, something does inevitably go wrong. Uh, uh, although you see all these companies uh, saying, well, we've got, um, you know, we're 96% first pass year, they're, they're, they're actually, not looking at the right of time, machine downtime they have in the factories, which uh, I think according to IPC is about 37%. <laughs> uh, so uh, an, an ongoing problem. Uh, okay. Um, is there an argument for having more inspection inside the systems? Um, what would you say to that, Ernie? Well, I mean, um, traceability, MES Industry 4.0. Yeah. I mean, that's you know definitely starting to become um, uh, requirement. In the, in requirement. Well, it's not a requirement, but it's definitely in the focus of the customers. Mm -hmm. So you know when you talk about that uh, full MES, it's being able to know what is happening from your boards going into the machines. Are the parts there? Are they not there? Are they in the right place? goes through the soldering machine, you trace everything that happens, how much flux you put on, how much heat, the soldering process and the movements, and as it comes out, then you inspect the actual um, solder joints. And having that tied into one package is, is uh, beneficial, right? Because then you have basically one footprint and right. not you know, this machine doing this, that machine doing that, and, and the other doing the other. So, so it, it, it makes it a little clearer for the customer. But, you know, it's it's not so common now um, uh, to, that it, that it's a part of everyday process. I don't see it, uh, you know, all the time, but it will it will become more and more. Are you doing more on, on this um, industry 4.0 stuff, um, Eddie? You um, ask, you yeah. You can ask for to, to extract data off the. Yeah, uh, we're we're doing that now. It's in the booth. Uh, Simon Smith from 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 Midland is discussing and showing that at the booth. I myself don't know as much. I 
pretty much stay in the academy part of our company. Mm-hmm. But yeah, we are talking about Factory 4.0. Right. What about Seho? What are you doing? Well, uh, we can integrate an uh, inspection system in our machines mm-hmm. to save footprint. And uh, one important thing, I think, is not just uh, collect the data, but really use this uh, to know when it's always one solder joint that causes some failures, then tune your soldering process and use this information and not just uh, do some manual rework or whatever. Right, and yeah, the whole point is to get actionable data so that you can correct it in yeah. the process and not produce a lot of defective It's holes. easier for selective soldering than for, for wave soldering and just correct one spot and right. you're good again. You're good again, okay. What's your view on this, uh, Alan? Yeah, we use the uh, the bottom side lookup camera like you all do, mm-hmm. and uh, you know you you can go ahead and do an inspection on a on a particular connector, a pro a, a, a problematic connector that every once in a while you've got a bridge on it. You can take a look at that mm-hmm. and go into an automatic rework cycle if you choose to do that, mm-hmm. and see if you can debridge it. And if it passes again, then you know it's good. Right. It's but if the problem is is that uh, that takes a lot of cycle time. Of course, really adds to the cycle time. Because then you'd have to do it twice for every board. No, no, but if there's if there's a problem connector, rather than trying to desolder it, fix it after mm-hmm. offline, you can do it on the machine. Mm-hmm. You can't do it. Okay. So, how do we um, maximize throughput, Ernie? Okay, so maximizing throughput. Um, there's two methods of soldering primarily, right? And that is a, a dipping module where you yeah. have a dedicated plate that has chimneys in specific locations and you mass solder the board and very, very fast cycle times, which is fantastic if you're doing the same board over and over and over again and you never change. Um, Most of the industry doesn't do that. So we're talking about XYZ soldering. If you have a board that's 10 by 10 and you have 100 connections to solder with one solder pot, Mm -hmm. right? And say it's one second per, it's 100 seconds. The only way to get it faster is to add another soldering module. That's the way it was. What we did um, this year, we released it here, is the VersaFlex module, which has two solder pots and one gantry, servo-driven gantries, and they have independent movement soldering different locations in the same module. So we were able to cut out that second module and have the same throughput in a smaller footprint package. That, that's, that's our strategy. Right. But Interesting. Okay. Uh, how would you address that? Uh, yeah, uh, throughput is, is uh, you have to look at it on a case-by-case basis. Like you mentioned, you might have some fixed nozzles that can solder the same thing that very quickly. Like you said, if you have a multiple nozzle yep. with single dip as fast as a wave, again, like you said, not a lot of people are doing that now. So many people are getting involved that they're not all high volume. So you usually got to mix and match with nozzles that you need. Sometimes you would just find the smallest nozzle you needed to complete that product and then use that nozzle everywhere, but it is sometimes you know, better to have a module with a large nozzle where I could solder multiple leads at mm-hmm. once and then a very fine point like a micro point to get into the really tight areas. It all comes down to, to money, really, because the faster you want to go, the more it's going to cost one way mm-hmm. or another. Right. Um, but yeah, Pillar House has done the same thing with multiple pots and machines, different configurations where you've got adjustable, so where you can uh, you, you can either operate these pots independently or in tandem. You can spread them out. Um, you know, change the nozzle pitch. You got different modules. You can break up flux from preheat to solder, so you're not waiting for the whole process in one machine. Okay. There's a number of things that Pillar House has got going, and the same same manner that he's speaking of, different movement of the bats X and Y and Z. So. I think everybody's kind of moving that that way to some degree at least. Depending. Yes, we also have uh, for selector machines we have uh, so called single mode where we have uh, two solar parts on one X and Y system with independent set axis and the program basically it runs in a loop so there's no fixed starting point and end point so we can almost double double the throughput uh, by just losing a little bit of transfer time. Is up to the operators know how to really optimize that process, or is there, do the you know? If they're trained well. If they're trained well. Yeah, if they're trained yeah. well. Yeah. But it doesn't it, it does? It's not like the software, the, the the machine software doesn't take in the 
data from the board and optimize no, the, the optimizing yeah. comes from the engineering respect the machine setup for one that's how you start mm -hmm. they make you have to buy the right hardware to do what you want to do so that starts with the engineers who are planning the whole thing mm -hmm. right. but then they have to incorporate the flexibility they might need down the line so yeah I mean it, then the operators have to know how to maintain it what's critical but the people who start the optimization people who specify the engineers who set up the right. line and Right. But the software makes it easy. Yeah, I mean, you, yeah the yeah. software. You can have a you know a JPEG or a you know an image of the PCB and literally point and click. Point and click, yeah. And yeah. it'll optimize it for you. And if you have yeah, two that, solder that's modules, it'll it. split yeah. it for you automatically to make sure everything's even. So that's pretty good. Yeah. You know, um, um, he is correct in that. You know, you 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 have to have the hardware, right, mm -hmm. um, to be able to do the job. Yeah. So is it? Are you going to have you know? A fluxer preheater and a solder module, or are you going to have two solder modules, or two solder pots simul simultaneously soldering, or, or um, you know, two solder pots split in the Y, soldering two boards at once? There's all kinds of things all that kinds you can of, do. Yeah, combinations. So, Alan, did you have any uh, suggestions on how you'd maximize throughput? No, I agree entirely with all these gentlemen. Mm -hmm. I think it's a multiple pod could be. I think the the real key is it's all case dependent. Yeah. I mean, in, no matter what you're doing with that customer, with their product line, um, then I think you can tailor whatever you choose to sell them exactly right. to what they need. And then you have True. to have the flexibility, maybe for down the line, or have a plan if something changes. You know, mm -hmm. Sure. Sure. And then the software mm -hmm. uh, that you use as new products come along to introduce new products that makes it easy from there. If you got to right. use the software. Okay. Yeah. So. Um, Eddie, what about um, these um, high thermal demand boards? Uh, how would you deal with these? Uh, well, you definitely are thinking about preheat. Um, mm -hmm. Top side is a big is a is a huge factor for lead free because you need that temperature your board at the top to be close to to reflow temperature so it doesn't freeze on the way up the hole. So, mm -hmm. top side only really came around in our equipment when we had a lot of lead free. In the beginning, when we offered it, maybe 50% of people bought the top side. But once lead, the lead free became common, like 99% of the people buy top side preheat. And now with very heavy boards, you might consider bottom as well. Um, yeah, preheat and heavy thermal boards, um, you're going to have to preheat. Most likely you need a flux so you withstand that heat. For one, it's going to take a little time to get to temperature. And you're also going to take a lot of time to solder it. So your flux has to be able to handle not only the preheat, but that soldering cycle. Because it may be several minutes before you get to that last point. Right. So mm -hmm. you need to consider your flux. Uh, if you've got, you've got a lot of preheat, you need to consider is, every, is everybody using infrared for preheat here? Or? We use both. Yeah. Both. Convection and both. IR. Convection and, and IR on both. Okay. Yeah. We have hybrid heating, actually. It's mm -hmm. uh, IR on the bottom, and the top side is a mix of uh, cal rod, which is a long wavelength, um, IR mm -hmm. and convection. Uh, right. So we found that doing you know some some gauge R and R studies on, on what is the best combination for all different factors, right? right? So you know we've got a machine and it's got to work for you know a, a two by four board and it's got to work by a, for a twenty by twenty board with you know right. a lot of layers. So so we found that, and I mean. For us, um, heavily thermally challenging boards, that's our wheelhouse, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, we've always sold topside heating. Uh, it's vitally important when you're talking about, you know, a lot of multi-layers. You want to minimize the delta T from the bottom side of the board right. or the top side of the board. Yeah. Um, sometimes, you know, with those really heavy boards, you know, the thermal energy is getting dissipated through every layer. Mm -hmm. So the more layers there are, you're, the, the bigger the delta T is going to be if you don't have sufficient topside heat. Right. So if you're only heating from the bottom. Mm -hmm. So sometimes, you know, you can really, you have to overheat the bottom, which then you kill the flux, like you mentioned, mm -hmm. right? Which is no good. Uh, so, so you really have to have a good strategy for heating top, right. and, bottom top and bottom to put the thermal energy into the board. Right. So you also got to make sure your components can handle that heat too. Well, yeah, that was not going to be my next point. I was going to say it depends also on the components you've got on there. Sure. Uh, what about you, Andres? Do you have any uh, view on this? Well, um, of course, you, you need to be sure that uh, the customer is not just heating up a soda bath to mm. to get uh, to get a good uh, barrel fill and then damaging the component. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so 
So it's a lot of a lot of know-how uh, or mistakes you can do mm -hmm. there when you don't know exactly what what to do. What, what to do? Yeah. yeah. I would only add that, uh, that when you're when you're preheating, a lot of times the preheating is done before the actual soldering cycle. You need to maintain that preheat right over the soldering cycle mm -hmm. to keep the board hot. Absolutely. If you don't keep it hot all the way through, it'll start losing temperature. Your process changes. So right. it's equally important to have the preheat over the solder pot. Right. How important is it controlling the cool down phase as well? Is that? I mean, you have some inherent. Uh, you know, as, uh, as soon as you turn the topside preheater off and, you know, you're not soldering in a specific location. It's a massive, it just cools yeah. pretty, cool quickly. Down pretty quickly. Pretty quickly. Natural. Cool down is natural. Yeah. Yeah. An important thing to like coming that out uh, Andreas mentioned, which is important to note, the solder temperature, right, mm -hmm. also plays a critical factor with heavy thermal components. And, you know, in a wave solder machine, they'll be like, oh, you know, we run our wave at 265, right? Right. Well, you're not going to run that in a selective solder machine. Because you have a little, you don't Smaller have you know, 1,500 pounds of thermal transfer mass in a wave yeah. running into a board. You have yeah. a little tiny nozzle, right? So, so you can see temperatures from 285 to you know 300, even, even 305. So peak temperatures yeah. are much higher. They're, they're higher, yeah. but you know the actual the, the the temperature of the solder is higher, but you know the thermal um, transfer of that versus a wave solder is, is it's about the same at those temperature differentials. Okay. You know, waves were designed in the past, and the reason they're so big is because they were supposed to act like an infinite thermal mass. So mm -hmm. they immediately heated the board to that temperature instead of vice versa, the board cooling the solder. In selective, it's the other way around because the nozzles mm -hmm. are so small. Yeah. But that, is, that was the purpose for having such big waves. And mm -hmm. that's why the process is the way it is. But mm -hmm. they did not want product to cool the solder. Mm -hmm. Right. So. Well, gentlemen, we're running out of time here, so um, I want to uh, say this has been a, a really interesting debate with uh, <laughs> a lot of um, different information. I've got to say thank you very much to all of you for taking part. Uh, Ernie Grice from Kurzelsta, Eddie Groves from Pillar House, uh, Andreas from Seho, and of course Alan Cable from Norton Ace. Okay. Thank you for joining us, gentlemen, and uh, thank, you. Thank, thank you for joining us. Uh, our next uh, program coming up at 12 o'clock today is the Keith Bryant Show. So stick around, and uh, we look forward to joining you then.